Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you happen to be watching this. I'd like to talk to you about an integrated approach uh, between uh, gender issues and broader sustainable development, and in particular the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I presume uh, everyone knows about the SDGs, the 17 goals and 169 targets agreed by the UN, which charts a, a pathway, if you like, towards a sustainable future. And rightly, there is a goal on gender equality, goal number five. But what I would like to talk about are the fact that these goals are not isolated. They have interactions uh, between them. In fact, the UN Secretary General described the Sustainable Development Goals as an indivisible whole. And if countries ignore, or if organizations or individuals ignore the overlaps and simply start trying to tick off targets one by one, they risk what we call perverse outcomes. Perverse outcomes are where if you do something good for one goal or target, it inadvertently does something bad for another goal or target. And equally important, you could miss potential synergies. In other words, if you do something good for one target, you can potentially do something good for another target at the same time. And just to give you a quick example, if you're working on gender and you want to enable women to be able to work from home, then one way of doing that is to help provide uh, lighting um, for the home, for, people, for, people who, for women who don't have uh, indoor lighting. That has uh, a, an already a synergy with goal seven, which, because, which is to improve energy access. So you're, you're already having a benefit in terms of your work on gender with uh, goal seven on improving energy access. However, if that energy is provided using fossil fuels, such as coal, then that has the potential to accelerate climate change, acidify the oceans, which undermines goals 13 and 14, life on land and life under the oceans, as well as causing problems uh, to health from things like air pollution, which is goal three on health. So, I mean, clearly you can avoid those potential bad outcomes by using renewable energy. So now, of course, from, you know, you're working on gender and providing energy to the home, but now you've got to think in your mind, you know, I've also got to be an expert on climate change, looking at the impacts of what I'm, uh, what I'm doing on climate change and health and life on land and life underwater. So your life's getting a bit more difficult. These interlinkages are not always straightforward. And here are some of the dependencies that you need to think about when you're looking at those interlinkages. Firstly, some of them are reversible and some are not. If you plant uh, a field of crops for food one year, you change your mind and you want to plant it for biofuels the next year. And then when you've done that, you realize that was a bad idea. The next year you can go back and plant food again. That's a reversible decision. However, if because of lack of climate change, we lose species, then that loss of species is irreversible. There's also a direction. You know, does A affect B and then B also affects A, which is a bi-directional impact, or is it unidirectional? So providing energy to people's homes benefits education because children can do their homework at night, but improving education does not automatically provide energy. So that's a unidirectional uh, impact. Strength, does the interaction with another goal have a large or small impact? If it only has a small negative impact, then it might be something you can manage or tolerate. If it has a very large negative impact, it might be something where you would need to change your decision. Uncertainty, how uncertain is that impact? If we're sure doing this over here has this impact over there, then we know what we're dealing with. If we're doing something over here and we really have no idea what it's gonna do over there, then that degree of uncertainty needs to be taken into account because potentially you could be doing something really bad and you don't know about it. Other dependencies, some of, the, some in, some of these dependencies are real and some are not real. Some are just issues of governance or management. So for example, um, the energy example that I used earlier, if you use fossil fuels to provide the energy, that has negative impacts. If you used renewable energy, it, you can avoid those negative impacts. So that negative impact is not um, a real dependency. It's simply a way that you manage it. Geography. Some actions have interlinkages in other places or countries, and some have impacts directly where you're doing it. 
So for example, if you build a dam to provide uh, hydro energy or water for agriculture, then you're, you, you're, you're taking an action. But if there is a, a village 100 miles downstream that is using that river for you know, providing its fishing for, for its, to get its food, then the impact you're having is taking place 100 miles away. Time sensitivity. Some actions play out in real time. Some actions take time lags. The classic one with a time lag, of course, is greenhouse gas emissions, which can sometimes take hundreds or even thousands of years to, to, uh, to come to fruition. And technologies. Technology can be a, a two-edged sword. Sometimes technology development can be a good thing. We've developed renewable energy and so on. But sometimes they might not be such a good thing. You know, the fact that we all have to have um, mobile phones every 10 minutes uh, and just throw them away, which uses up the world's resources, is probably not a good thing. So you, you need to start to think about not only what are those interactions, but what are the properties of those interactions and, and, and take those into account in how you manage them. So if, these, if, if we need to take into account these interactions, why, why is that not happening? And there are very, very good reasons why that's not happening. The first thing, everything is siloed. Government departments are siloed, Department of Energy, Department of Trade, Department of Finance, Department of Water. Company divisions are siloed. University faculties are siloed, Department of Mathematics, Department of Social Studies, Department of Business, and so on. Institutional organizations are organized into disciplines, Food and Agriculture Organization, United Nations Environment Program, United Nations Environment Program, and Development Program, and so on. Everything's organized into sector-based silos. And there's a good reason for that. It makes decision-making simple. You're talking to people who speak your language, who think the same way that you do. You use the same shorthand, the same acronyms. It makes decision-making quick and easy because you're talking to people who think and act like you do. The chances are you're going to agree much easier. Also, systems are set up to be competitive. Government departments compete for budgets, businesses compete for market share, universities compete for research funding and students, NGOs compete with, for philanthropic funding. But I'm telling you that you need to manage interactions with all these other organizations and sectors and so on. So how do you partner and work together and form stakeholder partnerships when the system is inherently set up to be competitive? And also there's an overhead to acting coherently. It's not easy. There's an overhead in terms of time and effort and money to act coherently. You have to take time to form partnerships. You have to learn to speak their language. You have to understand their acronyms. You need to understand where they're coming from. You need to, it takes effort. It costs money for people to meet and work together. So there are very good reasons why these interactions are, are currently very poorly managed, but it's absolutely essential that we do. Otherwise, we're not going to be making the best decisions. So I've just made your lives infinitely more complicated. You now need to be an expert in 17 goals instead of one. Uh, you need to think about all of these different organizations you need to partner with. You need to think about all of the different properties of all the interactions, and it all gets extremely complicated, and you've got to do a full systems analysis, and, you're never going to be able to do that in time and so on. But there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are several frameworks or shorthand approaches which help you through this process. And I'm just going to illustrate one, there are many. This one is, um, was developed under the auspices of the International Science Council, uh, and I was heavily involved in this development. This came out of a nature paper, uh, which um, came out first, and then that was followed by a much longer report, um, which I, have here and which I would encourage you to read. It's called A Guide to SDG Interactions from Science to Implementation. And what, what it starts doing is simply saying, here's a seven point scale from plus three to minus three. Look at your interactions and decide what they are. From plus three, which is if you do something good over here, it automatically does something good over there without any doubt. To right at the other end of the scale, the minus three is if you do something good over here, it does something bad over here, and there's nothing you can do about it. And then there's all uh, you know, shades of gray in between that, from reinforcing to enabling on the positive side, to constraining and counteracting on the negative side. 
So that then, by doing that, it, it gives you a, a sort of illustration then of what you're dealing with. And this has been done in this longer report. Unfortunately, it wasn't done for gender. And if I could have one recommendation to come out of this conference, it would be that this analysis of interactions between Goal 5 and the other SDGs be done. But this one shows from this report, which was done, one of the goals that was done was the Food and Agriculture Goal 2. And they did look at some of the interactions with Goal 5. And this just shows a graphic illustration. This picture on the right hand side says that, in fact, virtually all of the major interactions between agriculture and gender are positive. So in other words, they're reinforcing. If you do something good for agriculture, you're generally doing something good for gender equality. If you do something good for gender equality, you're generally doing something good for, um, uh, gender, for agriculture. And I'm, just, I can't, I'm not going to read all this out because I don't have time. Um, but examples, <coughs> excuse me, examples. So if we ensure food and nutrition security, that reinforces women's empowerment in turn. Women's empowerment is enabling nutrition security, partly due to their role in food production and preparation and their greater inclination to spend resources they control on family nutrition and health. And so on and so on. So these are not totally positive interactions. It's not automatic that if you do something good for agriculture, you do something good for gender. But there's a strong enabling factor there. And here's, I've picked out some of the phrases out of this report, which just show you some of the highlights of what they're saying. And the first, and I think incredibly important, is that gender inequalities are the most pervasive of all inequalities and interactions between this goal, that is the food and agriculture goal, and other goals are, are, are really strong. Ending hunger and improving nutrition is crucial for women due to their roles in food production, food preparation, and childcare but also because of their special vulnerabilities related to reproductive health. Undernourished girls and women are often least able to take advantage of development resources, whether that's microcredit to start, to start business, access to schooling, uh, access to paid work, and so on. So women are often the least able to take advantage. Empowering women in agriculture through increasing their decision-making over agricultural production. And women are often those who do the agricultural work, has been shown to improve both family and health and nutrition outcomes. And according to FAO, if women farmers had the same access to agricultural inputs, education and markets <coughs> as men, the number of hungry people could be reduced by 100 to 150 million in the 34 countries that FAO studied. So through providing greater access to resources and reproductive asset and productive assets to sustainable agriculture to women, the food and agriculture goal is also enabling gender equality and women's empowerment. So I think this starts to show you just through one, looking through the lens of one goal interaction between food and agriculture and gender, how important it is to take into account these interactions. And I'd like to finish with two points. Firstly, you must take into account the interlinkages when taking action on the sustainable development goals. And nobody should be working on one sustainable development goal or target in isolation. We should all be working on sustainable development. We should all be working for a sustainable future with a focus on one or more of those sustainable development goals, bearing in mind the interlinkages they have with those other goals and targets. So we're all working on sustainable development and hopefully together we'll be able to create uh, a more sustainable future for everyone and most particularly for women and girls. Thank you.